Hi, it's Dwyer. It's Wednesday, September the 4th, 2019. Gamblersadvisory.com, a free site. Bettingangle.us, a free site. Well, let's talk boxing. You know, it takes a lot. And I mean this. It takes a lot for me to award a fighter with my dreaded red cup. Right? We all have bad days. There are times where you're trying hard. Right? You've prepared. You've put your best foot forward. And for whatever reason, it doesn't work out. You get blown out. Right? Those guys who are making the effort don't get the red cup. To get the red cup, you've really got to be a buffoon that week. You've really got to go about things in such a way that YouTubers like me wonder if you're even motivated. If you've made the effort. If you've even tried to prepare. Well, Ramon Alvarez, Canelo's brother, deserves that red cup. He wins this week's Red Cup Award, right? I can't even remember the last time I gave a guy a red cup. You know, there he was about to fight Erislandy Lara. He's at the weigh-in. Fans like me were excited hearing about this fight. I thought, wow, Lara hasn't gotten a KO in his last three fights. Faded against Jared Hurd. I thought he faded against Castano. At 36, what did he have left at 154 pounds? A young man's division. Here he is fighting Canelo's brother. I thought, okay, you know, Ramon Alvarez has to realize since somehow the WBA decided to make this a title fight, which by itself is curious, Ramon Alvarez had to think, wow, this is a great chance for me to pick up a title here. Right? I got a 36-year-old in front of me who doesn't have, or at least hasn't had, recently a lot of power. Right? Let me try to impose myself on him. So you know the rest. They have the weigh-in. Now I'll buy a fighter being a few ounces overweight. I'll even buy a fighter being a pound overweight. Right? You know that cheesy excuse where people say, hey, the uh, hotel scale was a little bit different than this scale. All right. You know, maybe that last glass of water just hasn't gone all the way through your system yet. Right? Sometimes a guy will fail to make weight and they'll say, hey, hit the sauna. Right? The guy will put on the rubber suit. He'll go out and sweat out a pound in the one to two hours he's given. Well, there was no chance of that with Ramon Alvarez because for a title fight, one that was advertised and televised. Ramon Alvarez decided he was going to show up overweight. Not one pound overweight. Let's double it. Not even two pounds overweight. Let's double that. Not even four pounds overweight. This guy decides to show up 4.6 pounds overweight. You've got to be kidding me. You were looking at the guy and you thought, what's this dude thinking? But then you thought, okay, maybe this is part of a grand plan. Maybe he's going to rejuvenate his career by trying to roughhouse a very technical Arislandi Lara. Maybe this extra weight is going to allow him to throw it around the ring. Right? Run his body into Lara, who's a counter-puncher, who's hoping you throw something that he can counter. Instead, just go over there and hit him with a shoulder. Right? Come up against the rules. Use those four and a half pounds to get an unfair advantage. Right? You're not fighting for the title. Right? The sanctioning body sees you with all this extra weight. They're saying, player, you're not fighting for our 154 title. Right? So you're in there just really fighting to get the win, to make the statement. So then after this fight, you can pivot and say, look, middleweights, because you're too big for junior 
middle, right? Let's let's face it, you couldn't even make weight or come close in a title fight at 154. So you're too big for 154. Maybe Ramon Alvarez's game was to say, hey, middleweights, I'm here. You know, J-Rock, uh, Charlo, uh, Hurd, look me up, right? You know, I just beat Laura. You saw me beat Laura. We'll overlook the fine print that you were overweight. The fight was between two guys in different weight classes, right? I thought maybe that's his angle. So then the fight starts. You're wondering, gee, how unprepared is Ramon Alvarez? Man, this dude was so unprepared. It looked like he didn't know he was fighting a southpaw. Hey, I'm not the only one who knew he was unprepared, right? Folks, as the referee stops the fight in the second round, his own corner was throwing in the towel. How unprepared are you when your own corner is throwing in the towel in the second round? Not only that, understand, this is the first time Laura has gotten a stoppage since 2017. Right, 2017. <laughs> you know, let me say this too. You're fighting a southpaw who you know is crafty. Don't you at least say to yourself, you know, I'm not going to get hit. Certainly not early in the fight when I'm supposedly not tired. I'm not going to get hit with this guy's straight right, uh, excuse me, straight left hand. Right? I know he's a southpaw. I'm not going to get hit with that punch. Don't you at least force Laura to be creative, hit you with his non dominant hand. Right? No, no, that's not Ramon Alvarez. Folks, he gets hit repeatedly in the face with Laura's straight left. Repeatedly. Right? Let me also say, too, I know he's dazed. Uh, does he move out of the way? No. Does he grab Laura? No. What exactly was the game plan? If there was a game plan. So we just had a guy. In a nationally televised title fight. Show up more than four pounds out of weight. And then in the fight. Get KO'd by a 36 year old who hadn't knocked anyone out for three fights. Right? And get KO'd in such a way that his own corner thought he had no chance of coming back in the fight in the second round. Folks, I'll just say Ramon Alvarez has earned the Red Cup. Let me also pivot here. You just saw a southpaw handle business the way Luis Ortiz needs to against Deontay Wilder. Right? Lara is on Alvarez's hard left shoulder. Look at the setup. Lara's not in front of Alvarez. He's not even at 11 o'clock. I would argue he's at 10 o'clock or 9 o'clock in throwing that straight left on Alvarez. Now Alvarez, in part because he was determined to win a Red Cup, Alvarez doesn't turn quickly. Right? If a guy is trying to move to your side and you're in the ring, you need to deprive him of the angle he's seeking because at the end of the day, boxing's a sport about angles. So I'm guessing Deontay Wilder, if he comes in the ring and he sees Luis Ortiz moving over here to try to hide his straight left hands, I'm guessing Wilder's going to turn, right? He's not going to allow Ortiz to do what Ortiz wants. Well, here, Ramon Alvarez doesn't turn. Right here, Laura's able to set up shop at 
10 o'clock or 9 o'clock. Right? Way over on Alvarez's left shoulder. So you know the rest. He's firing straight lefts. Alvarez, of course, doesn't have a hand up, isn't ducking, isn't moving away. No, Alvarez is unprepared. Right? The guys over here, Alvarez, who barely seemed to know that Laura's a southpaw, didn't realize that Laura had a straight line. A straight line on Alvarez's chin. Right? Because again, Alvarez doesn't have a hand up. Luis Ortiz needs to leverage the fact that Wilder in some fights, right, not the Dominique Brazil fight, not the Audley Harrison fight, but in the Gerald Washington fight, for example, in the first Luis Ortiz fight, in the Eric Molina fight, there have been fights where Deontay Wilder has started slow. So my point to you is, what Ortiz needs to do is to go for the home run early. Right? You're fighting a knockout artist. You want to deprive him of the angles, move away from his right hand, right? Because you understand, Wilder's predominantly a right-handed power puncher. Move away from his right hand, set up shop at 10 or 9 o'clock on him, and fire left hands up top, straight lefts. If he puts a hand up, hit his body. Weaken him. Riddle his rib cage. Right? Southpaws need to take advantage of their southpaw stance while it's a novelty in a fight, early in the fight, before the other fighter makes adjustments. They also need to stay out of the line of fire of the other fighter's dominant hand. Best case for Ortiz is to fight the fight Lara did here. Let's shift gears a little bit. Now, people I respect greatly. He was a hell of a fighter. Hell of a fighter. Jeff Fennick. Right? Older generation. Hell of a fighter. Has been talking up Jeff Horn. Right? Fellow Australian. And has been saying, look, you see what Manny Pacquiao is doing. Right? Since Manny Pacquiao has raised his profile and has shown that he's at least competitive against the Keith Thurmans of the world. Well, so too is Jeff Horn who beat Manny Pacquiao. Right? When you beat a guy, when that guy goes on to do big things, that shines a great light on you. Right? And I think we all understand that losing to Terrence Crawford, well, everyone Terrence Crawford's fought's done that. You're losing to one of the very best in the sport pound for pound. So, you know, what Fennec is really saying is, hey, Jeff Horn remains armed and dangerous, right? Horn is a big puncher. Very big right hand. Well, here's the problem. He just got beaten up by Michael Zarafa. And Zarafa is one of these guys you need to keep track of. Understand, this is a guy who's been in with a bigger puncher than Jeff Horn before. Right? He was in against Kid Chocolate. Think about that. Chocolate stops him. But pull up a tape of that fight. Zarafa's not afraid because Zarafa has his own pretty good right hand. Zarafa's not running. He's actually trying to land his shot. Right? You could tell from the video. He views this as a shootout. So did Kid Chocolate. Now, Kid Chocolate got to Zarafa before Zarafa got to Kid Chocolate. But the point is, when you see a guy in the ring with a big puncher, and the guy is hanging around the pocket, that guy's not afraid. That guy's going to come after you. 
right? The guy's not there to go rounds. He's he doesn't want a moral victory of going the distance. No. The guy's in there and the guy feels he can neutralize your power. Let me also point out too that Zarafa, of course, fought Kel Brook. He's been in the ring with a guy who hit harder than him and Kid Chocolate and a guy who had faster hands than him and Kel Brook. In other words, boxing has KG veterans. Maybe the guy hasn't won a title. But when you look at the resume, you see some names and you say, well, this guy has been in the ring with world-class opponents. Right? These are the kind of KG vets who aren't buying the hype. They're going to make you pay for your mistakes. Well, here Jeff Horn makes a big mistake. Now, we're students of the sport, right? You understand when you look at a film of Jack Dempsey, when you look at a film of Rocky Marciano, Joe Fraser, Mike Tyson, you understand that these guys know how to hide their head. Right? All the guys I named were big punchers. Right? All of them wanted to get in the pocket against you and wanted to dole out punishment. But they didn't want to get hit on the way into the pocket. So all of the guys I named came up with ways to move their head. Right? You know, if I go like this, you'll know I'm imitating Mike Tyson. Right? All of these guys in their prime, Joe Fraser, Bob and Weave, right? All of these guys in their prime understood as hard as they hit. Right? And of course, Dempsey takes out a much bigger man to win the title, Jess Willard. As hard as they hit, they wanted to get into the pocket without getting hit. Right? So all of these guys are moving outside. Folks, it's a major part of their games. Now, I'll agree. Rocky Marciano gets hit in some fights, right? He's down early against Jersey Joe Walker. He's down early against Archie Moore. But when you look at the film, you'll notice he's not standing there like a plant waiting to get hit. No, you'll notice he's low. He's trying to time it. Right? He's moving his head. Now, I don't know who told Jeff Horn that he could just walk into the pocket against a guy who had already fought Kit Chocolate and Kel Brook. <laughs> Folks, be afraid of KG Vets. Right? Jeff Horn is upright, his head is exposed, has no clue whatsoever how to hide his head, and he's walking into the pocket. And Zarafa, who has a pretty good right hand, is making him pay repeatedly. Somebody in the crowd should have started yelling at him, Bob and Weave! Bob and Weave! Hide your head! Jeff Horn gets cut. Gets cut, is bleeding in the fight. I have the highlights in my favorites folder here. Jeff Horn gets taken apart, and the worst part of the fight for him repeatedly is him walking into the pocket. You know, he clearly wants to trade punches. But think about how ridiculous it would be if Mike Tyson just tried to walk in the pocket against George Foreman or somebody. So Zarafa, who is unafraid, I mean unafraid, systematically takes out Jeff Horn. Right? I know it's one loss. Jeff Horn's career is in jeopardy right now. Every opponent he faces from this point forward is going to think to themselves, okay, Jeff Horn is too upright. His head is too exposed. As he comes in the pocket with his hands low, I have a free shot on him almost every time. Let me say too, there are other ways to get in the pocket. I notice Golovkin is outside of the pocket, but he can hit you from across the ring. So he softens you up with some long range shots. So then after he hits you with a long range shot, he'll step in the pocket. 
Deontay Wilder against Audley Harrison. You remember that fight? Wilder's far away. Wilder lands a bomb. Right? This is, after all, the author of the bomb squad. Right? Wilder lands a bomb. Then, Wilder jumps all the way in the pocket. I believe he did the same thing against Sergei Lakovic. Look that fight up. Jumps all the way in the pocket. And then is in the pocket. Right? After you've been hit... A Golovkin or a Wilder will step in the pocket. Or after you've been faked out of your shoes. In other words, you've been hit before. You know Golovkin's throwing dynamite. He'll fake the punch, then jump in the pocket. The point is, there's a thought process that goes with jumping in the pocket. Jeff Horn didn't show that here. Jeff Horn got stopped. I believe his career is at risk because he's heavier than he used to be. He's now fighting fighters who view him as a blown up welterweight. Guys who have been in with heavy hitting middleweights. Right? Horn's defense, let's say Jeff Horn's not defensively blessed. Let's remember, Horn, Ali Funeka, Jeff Horn's down in that fight. That's a firefight. Right? Jeff Horn is not defensively blessed. It's showing as he gains weight. Guys aren't running from him. They're getting ready for him in the pocket and they're making him pay as he enters the pocket. He needs to take some time off, in my opinion, and work on some skills like bobbing and weaving or some long range shots that will allow him to then enter the pocket without guys planning to hit him as he enters. I talk here online about bending at the waist. I'm serious about that. If you're too upright, as we saw in the Andy Ruiz-Anthony Joshua fight, if you're too upright and you can't hide your head, you're a sitting target for KG veterans and elite fighters. Let's shift gears. And I was happy to see this because I like this guy. This guy has a great story where his parents weren't really thrilled with him boxing but the guy then started winning some big fights right his folks then said okay we'll give this career some time the guy became a champion he has great stamina he is a warrior he's prepared to outcourage you if I can make up a word here that's Jared Hurd, 6'1", 154 pounds. He had a contract that called for a mandatory rematch, right at his option, against J-Rock Williams. So J-Rock beats him the first time. Understand who Williams is. Very highly skilled, very technical, elite counterpuncher. Right? This guy is a counterpuncher's counterpuncher. Economy of movement sets things up. Where you throw a shot, he parries that shot, then hits you clean. Very few, very few in the sport can match this guy in the art of counterpunching. So, Hurd, who's really a survivalist type guy right who's really a guy who's in there and it's blood and guts and eventually his opponent fades think Lara fading in the last round of a very close fight with her right Jared Hurd loses to J Rock Williams the first time they actually announced that they were going to have the rematch Hurd wanted his belt back right away and I'm guessing here, behind the scenes, Hurd is having problems making weight. Understand, people gain weight as they grow older. There is such a thing as staying too long at a weight. Understand, even guys who've had a lot of success, Bernard Hopkins, eventually left middleweight, became a light heavyweight, Andre Ward, eventually left 168 became a light heavyweight right both guys always in great shape 
their bodies got heavier as they aged. They had to gain weight to compensate. Now you're 6'1", 154. That lasts for a portion of your 20s. How many guys do the people here know who are 6'1", 154 pounds and live physically demanding lives like, let's say, the life of a professional prize fighter? Right? If you know a construction worker or someone like that, someone who's out being physical, who weighs 154 and is 6'1", I'll tip my hat to you. Understand, if you're an energy guy, if you're a stamina guy, if your calling card is outworking your opponent, right? You're getting hit, but at the same time, you're doling out punishment and your opponent cannot match your stamina. Think Lomachenko, for example. Right? If you're a stamina guy, you understand that if your body can't make the weight class comfortably, you're going to be at a disadvantage. Right? If you're too weight drained, your punch resistance is going to go. If you're too weight drained, your stamina is going to go against a guy who isn't weight drained, who's a sharpshooter. Right? So, Jarrett Hurd has decided that he's not going to have the rematch against J-Rock Williams. Let's just call it as it is. It's taken both men their lives to get to where they are, right? A lifetime of hard work in the gym. Now. Jared Hurd is a roughhouse guy. He has some skills, but he hasn't developed counterpunching to the extent that Julian Williams has. Understand, Hurd is not ever going to match Williams in terms of being a gifted counterpuncher. He could be a very good one, but there's a gap. There would always be a gap. So Hurd's only chance of winning the rematch would be to collapse the pocket, to turn the fight into a roughhouse affair, to pretend he's Marcus Maidana, to J-Rock's Floyd Mayweather. Right? You see a guy who's a precision fighter, you have to make the fight imprecise. Elbows, shoulders, pushes, leaning on the guy. Right? Using your size, rehydrating after the weigh-in. So you're physically bigger than the guy and you weigh more than the guy. Right? Well, Jared Hurd now is thinking about going to middleweight, which I think is a great decision. Let me just say, I know these mandatory rematch clauses are a good thing to have in a contract. No question about it. Right? But those really apply if something odd happens in the first fight. Right? You're showboating, get hit with a lucky shot. You go down, you're knocked out. Right? Or that first fight, you had a bad cold. You had a migraine when you entered the ring. Right? Something that didn't allow you to be your best. Or you're an inside fighter and the referee didn't allow inside fighting. Right? But when you've been systematically beaten up in the first fight, right? The first herd fight here with Williams. Williams systematically beats him to the punch and beats him up. Right? Dare I say the Andy Ruiz fight. Right? Against, uh, against Joshua. When you've been systematically beaten up in the first fight, I think it's a mistake to fight the same guy again in the immediate rematch. Understand, there the guy's advantage is structural. You might not know why you lost. Worse yet, the other guy 
might actually know now exactly how to beat you. Right before the first fight, it was unclear. He hadn't been in the ring. I'm guessing J-Rock Williams right now knows what worked. He's landing several clean counters the first time against Jared Hurd. Jared Hurd needs to be on his front foot. He can't use his height on his back foot. He doesn't have that level of back foot gain. So rather than have two losses in a row, rather than try to squeeze your body into 154 and then rehydrate and hope your stamina and toughness offsets the other guy's technical superiority, Jared Hurd, according to reports, has decided not to have the immediate rematch. I think it's brilliant. Understand, I feel that Canelo will never again fight at 160 pounds. I think that opens the door. Canelo has multiple belts even after being stripped of the IBF title. Right? I'm not sure, by the way, if Golovkin beats the Revianchenko. You have big money fights, big money fights at 160 pounds. You have one of boxing's best pound for pound leaving the division. I know Canelo hasn't announced it yet. But you can't be in discussions with the light heavyweight champion and then expect to drop back down two weight classes to continue your career at 160. How did that work out for Cal Brook when he went up to 160, fought Golovkin, and then drop back down to 147. And just like Kell Brook was no longer Kell Brook, after he gained two weight classes, then dropped back down and returned to the weight class, just like Roy Jones Jr. was no longer Roy Jones Jr., when he dropped back down to the weight class after winning the heavyweight title. Right? Should Canelo try to come back to 160, I don't think he would still be Canelo. So if I'm Jared Hurd, quite frankly, I'm not even sure if I stop at 160. If I'm 6'1", why not let my body hydrate? I think he got some fascinating fights at 168. Right? I mean, let's say Jared Hurd. A guy who collapses the pocket, a guy who likes to get you on the ropes, is able to close the distance between him and Billy Joe Saunders at 168. I think that's a fascinating fight. Right? I think Jared Hurd is a guy with options. But fighting the guy who just beat you, who's technically better than you, at 154 would not have been the answer. I think he would have suffered in the rematch, just like I feel, by the way, that Anthony Joshua is going to suffer in his rematch in Saudi Arabia against Andy Ruiz. That's how I see it. Let me hear from you. I hope you leave your comments in the comment section of this video. Thanks for stopping by.